Hello, do you love stories? I mean, do you really love stories? Then welcome to Ruminations on Tony's Tall Tales, where stories take the stage. In this part two episode of our introduction, uh, training wheels are off. I'm running the host spot now, <laughs> and I'm still joined with my good friend, Mitch, as we um, dive into a little bit more of the conversation we're having about um, stories and just what they mean for us. I think, I think first off, I wanted to uh, touch a little bit more on the background, uh, my background, to, to give the listeners uh, an idea. I came in to this from the acting standpoint. Um, I moved out to California several years ago to pursue a career in acting. And you know, it's definitely a struggle in terms of having the career that a lot of actors envision. Um, it's very difficult to uh, just have it um, because there's a lot of uh, things that go into it, but also too, where we deal with a lot of traps and pitfalls and elements that we really need to consider or don't consider uh, until either much later or some of us just give up and then we go do something else. Um, so I've been acting for several years. It's now been probably close to about 20, 20 years I've been uh, been acting, uh, doing a lot of different work either in theater, television, movies, um, commercial work. And I basically came into writing because I wanted to uh, start creating my own content or being a, a little bit more of control in my career in developing my own work. And I had ideas that were bouncing around in my head and I was trying to figure out a way to formulate them. Um, and that was really the, the reason why I, um, I kind of started with um, trying to go down this path and, and make it uh, the focus of my career. Uh, some of the current projects that I'm working on is I'm trying to complete a James Bond spec script. Um, when I saw that in your notes, man, I was like yeah. brand new news to me. <laughs> if there was a smooth dude who should do a James Bond spec script, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it's it's interesting because – swear uh, on your podcast? Oh, absolutely. Smooth yeah. motherfucker. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I do tend to to, to 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 like some of the nicer things of life, uh, especially the wardrobe that Sir James Bond, uh, wears <laughs> <laughs> and dabbles in. Uh, for those that don't know, spec means uh, speculative sp screenplay. And these are essentially screenplays that are not commissioned. Um, they're unsolicited. Um, and usually they tend to be based off of an established work. They're really a showcase for a, a writer that doesn't have any sort of you know credentials or or cachet to really um, showcase one's work, so is it a tough thing to get that in front of somebody. Yeah, it well, and that's the biggest thing is just to have something where you can say I can write, I can write a screenplay, mm -hmm. and because the the thing is is what you want to do is have works that are completed. Because I can't really say that I'm a writer unless um, I have stuff that's finished. Because ultimately what's going to happen is the writer, uh, whoever you're talking to, is going to ask you, oh, so what have you written? Uh, is there something I can take a look at? Or, uh -huh. or is, is there any of your work that I might know? Um, and so my goal is to have something where I can say, yes, I do have something you can take a look at. <laughs> yeah. uh, ideally, this probably wouldn't be a script that would be made. Um, uh, originally the, the, the tall tale was probably that this would be something that I was hoping that would get made, but that's not the end goal. The end goal is just to have something finished. Um, so that is my, my singular focus right now. I'm trying to get that done. Um, roughly about 60, well, 50, 50, 55 pages into oh, it. God. That's, what's a normal, um, like 80 pages, 80, 120, what? Yeah, the for the for the two hour mark, you want to be at a, a one twenty. One twenty, one thirty is like your your standard action. Uh, yeah, adventure. Your your romantic rom coms are around eighty. You know, your comedy is around eighty pages, because um, you want that hour and a half mark. Because roughly what it, it breaks down to is they say it breaks down to two minutes per page. Okay. Um, so, uh, that's, that's how much screen time will actually be per page in your script. Um, 
so yeah, there was a lot of research that went into this script that I'm working on. Um, a lot of stuff that I've been trying to um, incorporate. Um, Does Jane so, Clark have a dog? Yeah. <laughs> He's going to have a couple of dogs in, in this script. Um, yeah, so like... Yeah, they they're really they're, they're really excited that about this script as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's about time our canine friends need to you know serve a, a better spot in his uh, rogues gallery. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, like a, a sidekick. Oh, that's it. It's a sidekick. Edition. It's a sidekick. Well, but, and yeah. the problem is, it's everybody's going to copy it. It's from the the John Wick. You know, like oh, John right. Wick had the dog in it. In, in it so now everybody else is gonna, now it's James Bond's turn. I was thinking more like James Belushi, like K-9, or maybe Tom Hanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> turn, turn hooch. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's – that's uh, I well, essentially, too, that's why I got rid of my systems before this quarantine happened because yeah. um, I was trying to really hunker down and try to finish this, um, yeah. this script. Um, and then after that, I've got the original television series that I'm going to be developing with uh, my wife. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, and then uh, this ridiculous novel series that I have no idea how it came into being per se, but also to how I'm going to finish it because currently it stands at one of those six book series. Um, oh, jeez, I don't know how I'm going to finish that. <laughs> it's it's going to be my magnum opus. Yes, dude, and I was like all excited because I wrote like five pages on the cure. <laughs> <laughs> That's really exciting, man. Like the the opus, the, the the grand epic. Like that's the that's awesome. That's the I want to say that's the dream, but there are a lot of dreams. Do you did you do you outline your work first? You kind of just like go with the flow. How, what's your what's your process? That's that's what's been really interesting about so far. The and I say beginning of my process. I really have been trying to do this over the last couple of years. Um, I've done some a lot of workshops, a lot of uh, courses uh, for fundamentals in, in, in writing. Um, I did some uh, workshops at a, a theater house here in Los Angeles. Um, that was really really beneficial, and it was all it was great too because it was taught by some some people who have done work in television. They are established play writers. Uh, they have television credits and film credits, so they they know what the fuck they're talking about. Um, so it was nice to. to to, to kind of workshop some pieces, some smaller pieces like short uh, short stage plays, uh, short stories. Um, but I'm still trying to figure out my process. And I think that's what's really kind of interesting is I'm trying to lean more into it because at first it's very daunting because you feel like, you, where the fuck do I start? You know, yeah. how do I tackle this? You know, how am I supposed to complete 120 pages of something out of nothing you know because you're essentially you are essentially creating everything you're establishing you're creating the the sets that it's going to be in you're gonna uh, the locations the characters their motivations the plot um so i've i've been kind of doing a little bit of both figuring out what works for me sometimes what i've noticed is that i will picture scenes in my head and i will try to just write the scenes out uh, other times I will start breaking out, okay, what's, well, let me break out an outline of what the story, what may be the main plot points, or what are some of the, the beats that I feel that are, are going to be um, uh, critical to this story. Um, for, the, for the novel, it's kind of a little bit of a both, because the program that I'm using, you can kind of almost do it both ways. You can write out pages but you can also break it out into outline uh -huh. um so i think i think right now for me it's a combination of both um i don't i don't have a clear cut where it's like okay i start i run out the outline and then write pages or i just write my pages out and then i'll i'll break out an outline later um so that's what's been pretty interesting is is finding my own process and my own way of working can i derail you just a little bit there and just ask me because some people talk about like like um, like over education or like if you kind of uh, anesthetize a subject so much to the point that the creativity is lost and and I'll explain what I mean like if you have a box of the way that I view it like there's a box of crayons with like eight colors 
And the more knowledge you have, it's like, and then you get like the 16 pack or the 32 pack or that big ass Crayola box that had the sharpener in it. Like for me, the more music theory I learned, the more knowledge I had, the better I could create. But some people think that that might take away from it. Sounds to me, and I don't want to put words in your mouth and you tell me what you think. Like, it, do you feel like uh, delving into the the format and the um, the kind of more rigorous, like this is how it works thing stifles your creativity or do you think it's helped you? I think it's it's interesting because I think for for me I've had to become a little bit more conscientious of I personally and this is speaking for me I tend to be over analytical. Uh-huh. So for me I will keep soaking up theory, I will keep soaking up format, I will keep soaking up all the the education. I think what I've had to figure out for myself is I've had to just start writing. Okay. And I've just had to start, okay, I, I, I understand this. Uh, some of it has been helpful in terms of, you know, knowing how to format a, a screenplay. Uh -huh. But now you have programs who already kind of do a lot of the formatting structure for you. Mm -hmm. um, but at least I have an understanding of how it's supposed to, to function. Sure. Uh, or at least how it's supposed to be constructed. Um, for me, it's been more of just, okay, just start writing. Don't try to overanalyze it. Don't try to overperfect it. Just start putting words to a page and That's figure the rest out, out yeah. later. Um, and, or, or fill in the gaps, you know, like, because there, there's going to be gaps, but it's more of that thing where I've noticed for myself, and this is probably true for some, a lot of other people too, is, is we kind of start thinking that we have to learn more. We have to know how this works. We have to know this, but it ends up being more of uh, that's our excuse to actually not put pen to page or oh my goodness, you know, yeah, fingers to a keyboard, and yeah. and then it's like. Uh, because also too, what I what I've leaned into more as well is um, understanding and being okay that what you first put down is going to be shit, and that's totally fine. It should be shit. Your first draft of anything is going to be garbage, mm -hmm. but you're not going to be able to revisit it or re redo it or go over it again unless you have any if there's nothing <laughs> on there to begin with you gotta have something to work with you can't yeah uh, yep. exactly yeah. so that's for me is 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 i i love learning so much in terms of i just love information i love gathering more information i love uh, obtaining new skills um that i've had to to be careful about okay that's fine. Let's let's get down to action. Let's start putting some of these theories and and processes into play, into actual play. So, what drove you to start doing this? What? Why? I mean, you wanted to take control of your career more, and you wanted to delve into that stuff. What is the? I guess the impetus for for stories. I think the biggest thing was what we had briefly mentioned before was creation. I think as an actor, I felt hampered by the fact that as an actor, you have to rely so much more on other people around you to be uh, involved in, 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 in something being created. Um, you need a screenwriter. You need a director. You need um, photo uh, uh, director of photography. You need other actors. You need sets. You need environments. You need sound. You need all these other elements to be part of something to create. And I just felt for myself, there was this yearning where I, I just wanted to be able to create something and have more control of being able to do that. And I think that's what's really been drawing me to, to, to the writing because you, you essentially do have control over, over all aspects of the story. And it's it's interesting too because when I when I wrote down of what what story is, is uh, it's it's literally defined as an account or imaginary of it's an account of imaginary or real people and events told for entertainment. That's the first definition of story. Uh -huh. um, and then the second definition is an an account of past events in someone's life or in the evolution of something. 
Um, so I don't think it's so much... Some people write stories because they want to have an impact on some on somebody. Mm-hmm. I think for me, it really does come to the fact that I just want to have something that says I made that. Whether anybody likes it or whether uh, people don't like it, I, it's it's almost like that's not even. Uh, I don't even really care about that. The fact that I can have something tangible that says this I created. You know, I think that's what really drives me is, is having something like that. Um, the results, because I, I find that a lot of my life, I like tangible results. I like having results for things that I do. You know, um, if there's a if there's a list of things that I need to, to get done during the day, I want to be able to have those boxes marked off. <laughs> I want to say yes. <laughs> Those were done, and I have something. Yeah. yeah, the car got washed, or you know, I I vacuumed the floor, and now it's clean. Um, I think that's what's really the driving force behind why I wanna I wanna write. I mean, I don't want to take it like too deep, but kind of, like, <laughs> I, can't avoid, I can't avoid it. Like, the act of creation is like this rally against yeah. the and against what you know the inevitable. And yeah. so, I think you know, in telling stories, we're not only doing something for ourselves and creating. But like in, and even in this endeavor that we're uh, undertaking now, you know, it's this like, yes, like this mark, I was here. This yeah. is, this is what I, <laughs> what I had to say about it, you know, and then passing that on, you know, yeah. the tradition and then became like written, which has become, you know, film, which became, you know, digital, whatever, like this, this desire for us to pass on what our experience was, you know? Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that's pretty apparent in, in just males in general, because we don't have the ability to give life. Oh, we well, can help the creation process, but we are not the ones that are manifesting life into the sure. world. So I think for males, a lot of times we, we do all these other things to manifest <laughs> create creation into the world. So that's a great point. That you, you, what's that? You, is, is this like a, a new theory of womb envy? <laughs> probably man <laughs> interesting wow yeah. i never looked at it like that yeah i think i think that's where uh, some of the deep primal like yearning comes from is mm-hmm. this ability you know that's why we erect these large buildings <laughs> <laughs> to leave our mark on the world yeah huh. wow that's interesting yeah I think that that's something to be delved into somewhere along the line. (laughs) Why are dudes so cocky? Like, like, well, we can't really manifest life, so we're doing it by we're going to make a statue of ourselves. Exactly. We're going to make the tallest building in the world to show our our phallic symbol. Oh, my God. (laughs) It's all because of womb envy. At the end of the day, men really just – uh, respect and envy the ability for the the female the species to be able to yeah. create life. We're just second tier to that. Yeah, interesting. Because we we there is nothing else on the planet than that female organ that will bring any man to the ground. Like there is nothing else that this man will bow down to, or that has more power over him that he he will subjugate himself under. And, and that <laughs> well, my my, uh, my nana and mom and aunties all always said uh well you know the man is the house of, uh, the head of the house but the woman is the neck and she turns that head any way she wants <laughs> okay so i always had these like really strong powerful women role models in my life that i was like okay i get it all right check <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that's what's interesting too because i've i've balked not in the way you would think, but where a lot of writers will talk about creating strong women, that we need to write more strong women. Mm-hmm. I think it's not the fact that they need to write, because women are already inherently strong. I think, I think that's a fallacy that, that women need to be written as strong women. Uh, women are already inherently far stronger than uh, us male mortals could ever be. Um, I think it's just more of the prism, you know, being able to, to, to view the woman 
and and write her in her more complete light than than she's objectified as normally. Um, so I think it's more of writing the woman as the woman actually is, you know, instead of being subjected under a, a, a the lens of a, of a, of a man. Um, and not to say that men can't write women, but just the fact that we need to be a lot more open or understanding of that we have a we we ultimately have a bias and we have to be aware of that bias and um, allow the the voice of the true woman and whatever story that's being told to to come out a little bit more fully a little bit more um, natural. Yeah, sorry, I got off topic. I don't know. I, I think it's all on topic. Yeah, <laughs> and that's one that I, I'll I'll throw out there for maybe uh like to, maybe if you want a guest on uh the from the red room or maybe for a later cast the idea that uh you have to have the point of view in order to write a point of view and i'm not sure exactly what that that conversation is but it's interesting to me because the the idea that you have to see it to be it kind of thing and Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting for me individually because of my upbringing and the things that i saw the things i was exposed to uh i don't feel like i had to limit my role models by gender race Mm -hmm. Any of those things, like for me, someone to look up to is someone to look up to, regardless of any of those other outer kind of uh, characteristics, you know. But anyways, yeah. I, that's a sidebar. <laughs> like that. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think that's it, it, it's a good dovetail, I think, into why you know we were thought we were thinking about why humans are fascinated with story. Why why do we think story is so important? Why it continues to 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 live on and. I think we touched a little bit on it is is you know it it's a way to leave pass down something to future generations it's our ability to leave our mark on the world um our interpretation of what our you know small sliver of perspective was on this uh grand experiment uh uh-huh. um, i know you mentioned too that it you know when when you engage with story um we have all these different emotions that come up, you know, we feel excitement. Yeah. There's some that are just merely entertainment, uh, some that actually inspire us, some that actually make us question, make us ruminate (laughs) and make us maybe, uh, change our, our, our perspective a little bit. Um, so it's pretty fascinating. Uh, has that, has that been like some of your, your encounters with some of the stuff that's really resonated with you? Like what, um, what has driven me to create or it, either like stuff that you, you, you saw or read or stories that were really impactful to you that, yeah, you're whoa, like completely changed maybe how you looked at something or how you thought or how you felt. I think that you, it's really, I mean, well, that's not true. I was going to say it's really hard to not be, but I mean, I, I know a lot of people personally uh, that don't seem as affected by story. People mm-hmm. who are not, they don't ingest it the same way that maybe I do. And I'm not saying that like I'm singular in this, but I think that there are some people who uh, story is, and the narrative is simply passing and they, it's, it is strictly entertainment, but and and that's there's a place for that too and for me the most impactful things the things that i carry with me are those stories that uh give me hope things that give me uh that open my eyes to to the visions of what the human experience can be uh, you know those are the things that i carry with me the most is that is that what you're asking am i totally stupid here right now oh, no, no, no. because it's it's fascinating because when you really think about it and I, and I was trying to 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 kind of ruminate on this is we the stories are all around us as yeah. as in the simple form of jokes you sure. know when you're when you're having a conversation with good friends or even family where you're just having these stupid silly tales where you'll, you'll reminisce about, oh, remember that that time that so-so did this? Or yeah. remember when you locked your keys out of the car? And 
I had to come on, get you all the way from you know <laughs> two hour drive. You were stuck at two 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 in the morning, um, to something more you know traditional or formal like a book or a newspaper or you know even the stories. One of the things that's been really big right now that I I found out is this um this racing Formula One racing and uh-huh. or these these um not only Formula One but any sort of race race um events right now there's the everyone keeps talking about the storyline <laughs> and how these there it's not so much that they're watching the race it's they're watching these storylines between these different people play out and that's what's fascinating to me is is that's what is captivating people is a lot of times stories and okay. what what we really you know are 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 yearning for is these kind of these exciting elements of, of life play out within these different stories. Well, when, when you told me that this is what you wanted to do and that this was something that you were going to discuss, I, re- I remembered in school, you know, there being like certain types of stories. And so I, I went back and looked at it again to see, and I guess the, the seven story archetypes, mm-hmm. this, this is what I found. And obviously you are much more educated on it than, than I. So what I found was overcoming the monster Mm-hmm. Uh, rags to riches the quest voyage and return comedy tragedy and rebirth and that those are the the archetypes of of story and so like what you're talking about like racing because that, that again is out, outside my realm of knowledge right now but they're racing so you have an action they're the racing but it's really the story about the guys who are doing the racing that is the part that's 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 grabbing people is what you're saying. Yeah, because like there might be beef with somebody uh, with, within the team. Maybe there's a, one of the teammates is is not following instructions, or they're doing things that are going against what the team is trying to accomplish, uh, or there's rivalry between another person and a different team. And there's also too there's this whole strategic element. You know, you've got a pit at a certain time. You know, like. <laughs> You've got to uh, uh, constantly take in information from your car. Um, you know, during the race itself, there might be somebody might be driving in a way that's um, not sportsmanlike, you know, and that causes uh, somebody on that other team to, you know, either have a penalty or be disqualified or something happens to their car. There's like all this stuff. And there's even this, this political stuff, like, you know, like, Maybe somebody's under contract from a team and isn't getting the contract that they want, but they're producing. And it's like, yeah, all of these different elements, that's just, it, it's unbelievable. And it's just, it's racing. <laughs> you wouldn't think like it would be as exciting, but these people, what I'm finding out is like, that's what people are really talking about. It's like these storylines and it's. It's You're right. There's story all around us. That's yeah. like there are all those little bits are involved in that, or like maybe from who who the sponsors are. Maybe I mean I don't yeah. know. I'm just you know uh, what's the word? I'm just guessing at this. That what the, like so maybe the sponsors are not you know like politically aligned with the way they with the team is. That's you're right. There's story everywhere, and that's what people gravitate to. Yeah. So it's fascinating. What what. I, because also too, like you'd mentioned, the the elements are essentially uh, finite. You would think, you know, like the the fundamentals of story are finite. So you would think you can't have infinite possibilities out yeah. of these finite elements. But we're seeing time and time again these infinite possibilities <laughs> and these these variations of the same. Because it's all the same tale. Yeah. It's all the same tale but it's being told in completely different ways um through because it, because again it goes back to the perspective you're seeing it through everybody's different unique lens so everybody's having a different take on it um because they're seeing it differently a never-ending story yeah <laughs> Do you want more and amazing and awesome content just like this? Great shows with fun hosts. Do you want to indulge in some great discussion and rumination on a variety of topics? Join us at ruminationsradionetwork.com, the newest home to a diverse cast of podcasters and masterminds. 
So are we are we as a as a species as a, as a people as a spiritual entity are we heading towards the ultimate story? I mean, are we retelling all these stories? You're talking about there being a finite number of combinations and finite like basic types. Are we? You know, is there maybe some core of us, and I'm getting a little philosophical here, that is driving to finally telling the perfect story? Is there an end story? That's 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 a million dollar question, right? <laughs> like if <laughs> if there is an end, if they if there is some sort of ending to the story, yeah, mm-hmm. you, I, I mean that's that's kind of kind of the question, and I, I personally don't think I have I. I have a solid answer. I've got theories and ideas of, of what may be at the, at the end of this grand experiment, if anything. But I don't, I don't know. I think this is just going to keep going until either we blow up the Earth ourselves <laughs> or, or we, like, find a way to, to, to jack our consciousness into some other planets, you know, and start planet hopping. A post-biological society, will they have a need to have stories? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's it almost feels like it it's it's part of us where it's always there's always going to be that need cuz you know even by this definition it entertainment even if it's just to entertain us I think there's there's some aspect of it where we just love the play of it. Yeah. And I think we're never going to get we're never going to get away from that. We're never going to say, "Oh, I don't want any more play." Yeah, not me. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I want to do is play. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of want to come back to this thing. Um, you briefly mentioned it because it goes into the, one of the topics I wanted to talk about was what elements support a great story. Because yeah. we have a lot of we have a lot of examples of stories that are terrible or I don't <laughs> don't I shouldn't say terrible, but probably don't engage us in the way that you know we think they would, or the majority of people would think, would hope they would. Mm -hmm. Uh, You had this thing that you were talking about with uh, The Last of Us Part Two, where you enjoyed it, but you felt like the the creators, you were leading you somewhere where you ultimately didn't think that you ended up at. And I I was fascinated because I really wanted wanted to hear your take on that. Okay. Uh, Well, there's been a lot of talk in recent years, and I think with story, and you'll have to bear with me for a second, uh, with story, like a lot of aspects of human existence, I feel we are evolving and getting better at. It. I don't think that the best stories have already been written. Hmm, I think that we'll continue to, just like the best athletes, you know, we've gotten faster, stronger. You know, I don't see why our intellectual pursuits would be any less. So with story, I think we get more and more complex. We can, we are able to connect better with audiences. Um, so my my point being with that is I think that in the last few years, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of uh, buzz around things like um, subverting expectation. Oh. And I, I get that. But to a degree that if you continually subvert expectation, you're you're delivering expectation. So it's, it's only had... <laughs> It's got a shelf life, right? Like, yeah. you know, and I don't feel like they subverted my expectations necessarily, but there are events and, and things in that, that story. And I, I really, I really don't want to spoil it for you because, you know, it, it was really a great experience I felt for me, even though I didn't agree with some of the story directions, but that's the great thing about narrative too, is you can listen to someone's narrative, listen to someone's story. You don't have to agree with where it goes, but Hey, you agreed to, to go on that adventure, you know? And, yeah. And, you know, it's, I'm fine with not agreeing with the way a story goes. I don't feel like I got to tell them to correct it because if you're just making it just the way I want, then you're not creating your vision and I'm just dictating to you what to write. You know, so I, I'm not that, that fan, exactly. I will, you know, I will listen to what you have to tell me. That's your story. Anyway. Um, well, and it did, it did resonate with some people. Some people did like the direction and yeah, yeah. you can go over it. Cause I don't think there was anything that I didn't, not know about because i know that uh joel dies very quickly in the game i cried i haven't cried at a video game in years i cried so that was a subversion because that you they made it appear that he was going to be in it for much longer but he's like out very quickly right yeah it was one of the most brutal things like after that scene i didn't think i could play the game Mm. 
I was really torn up about it and it, it was so difficult for me to go on. And, uh, I, that was again, kudos to Naughty Dog for pulling that off. Like to have that kind of a reaction, like this guttural kind of like, I was like, Oh my God, I don't know that I can do this. Yeah. And then the part that I, I know that they were trying, I don't know. I don't, I can't speak for that. That's wrong with me. But then in mid game, taking over the antagonist perspective who you'd see yeah because you're playing as the other uh uh woman right yeah yeah now i got no problem with that character and i i and and again a lot of this is second hand people talking about they didn't like her that she was too like built and just some really silly things that people oh yeah the the bullshit shit yeah (laughs) really come on grow the fuck up yeah but and so i didn't mind any of that stuff but i I was into the tale for the the vengeance side of it, and that sounds really terrible. I don't, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, a, I'm not a bad person, I promise. But like, I like revenge tales because I like to see people get their comeuppance, and it sounds kind of shitty, but like I, the idea of karmic justice kind of thing, and yeah. and I get they were trying to show me their other the other perspective, you know, and, and see from her point of view what happened and. Um, our buddy Ken, who's uh, the host of the podcast uh, Ruminations from the Record Store, it, he was talking about he's when he, as soon as Joel died, he's like, well, he probably deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> probably something Joel did because Joel is not a saint, and uh, and I didn't look at it that. Anyway, the point being is that uh, I I took over playing as that character and I did it because I had to do it to, to finish the game and to see where it landed. But if it had been my choice. Like I still felt attached to Ellie's storyline mm-hmm. and narratively in the end, Ellie lets her go, but Ellie didn't get to see the things I saw. Ellie wouldn't have at that point, the insight to this other character's motivations or life. You, she wouldn't have been as connected because she didn't play 15 hours as the other character to yeah. get that attachment. Okay. So I still feel that Ellie still would have been filled with enough vengeance and rage that she would have exacted that revenge on the character. And, you know, mm-hmm. you can have favorites or not, but I mean, I, I felt still more connected to Ellie and to Joel than to uh, the other characters. See, I even already forgot her name. <laughs> but, so, I mean, but what a great experience that was. And I, and yeah. I know that I was meant to feel those conflicting elements like yeah let me feel empathy and sympathy to this girl who had her father killed you know and the the parallels between her and ellie i mean okay guys like spoon feed me and what are you spielberg i mean come on like just here you go this is how you're supposed to feel like i get that but it was still didn't detract from the enjoyment so but do you feel like it it tried to be and this is something i talked with somebody recently too is the fact that some storytellers try to get too cute they try to get too clever with the story that they're telling uh-huh. and not feel that the story can stand on its own in, mm. in its simplicity. Um, did, yeah. you, did you get a sense of that? Like maybe they were trying to, to overcomplex it too much or, or overcomplicate it a little? Maybe, I, you know, kind of like going back to some of the things you said earlier about like um, – overthinking and overanalyzing and i think maybe they got a little bit too deep into uh, what they were trying to accomplish or maybe they their sights were set too high and again I'm, i hate to even say those things because i do really think that's one of the best games i've played in years again i finished i never finished games I'm, you're lucky if i put three hours into a game like no joke like <laughs> I, i'm a game taster i'll play like the first hour of your game and then i'm done you're Just, done I'm done. But Unless that's Fantasy Star. Then you're in it for the whole... <laughs> then I'm in it for <laughs> Fantasy Star, I'll play till the end of time. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think maybe they were... They over, maybe overthink, overthink, overthought it. Uh, they were... Yeah, they bit off a lot, and that's fine. But, yeah, they may be too cute, too clever. Like, look at what we're going to do, and we're going to manipulate your feelings and your emotions uh, and sometimes it's like, look, sometimes you do need to just go straight through like, hey, this is the story. This is the core and not dig too deep. And that's because that's one of the things I think a lot about because I 
I am very conscientious of, of not trying to be too cute, not trying to over engineer sure. the stories that I'm writing. Um, because the worst thing you can have, like, I don't, I don't care about any of the negative criticism. Like that really doesn't bother me. What would bother me if somebody says, I don't understand or, or they were confused or they were lost or didn't it make sense. Yeah. Um, gotta be organic. That, exactly. It, that would, that, that would bug me if it was like a yeah Game of Thrones last episode <laughs> finale. And it's like, oh, motherfuckers. <laughs> that thing is going to go down in history as just this total fumble the ball story. Uh, yeah. Oh. Because here's a perfect example. You spent six and almost a full season. Well, not so much a full season, but you spent six seasons of, of building a character. So we got to see her motivations. We got to see basically her, her just whole, whole, whole being. And then in a few episodes, you make a complete 180 that goes against everything that we've watched to up to this point. There was nothing in that 180 that gave us enough from an audience perspective. Like this doesn't make sense. Yeah. This is not the character. We, that's a we, we that's yeah. the cool thing to do now. That's a cool thing, man. Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you get the memo? So, oh, the memo. Memo. so my story is going to be shit because apparently I'm not following the memo. <laughs> yeah, you got to go, go check your memo because that's what we do now. But it's in, it's fascinating because uh, uh, they it's it's fascinating to take so because you, you kind of almost wonder if they had not caught up with uh George R. R., what what would have would the outcome have changed that much? Or would it have been the same? I think it would have changed. I think those guys were good at adapting but not good at creating. Yeah. You know, so that, but you know, who who am I? I don't have a bajillion dollars from a super duper <laughs> successful show. So good for them. But you know, we 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 like stories that'll surprise us, but not necessarily. But we don't want to be betrayed. Yes. You know, that's when I don't like a story. I I can't feel betrayed. I can be surprised. I can have my expectations quote subverted, but don't betray me. Don't betray the truth of the story. That's a great. That's a great way of putting it. And and that and that's what I'm I'm really keyed in on is the truth because. There's a thing in um, in writing where they say you have to be okay with killing your babies. Yeah. Um, not literally, but um, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The show's not that dark. <laughs> but, Baby killing. Yeah, but when you when you write something that you fall in love with, uh-huh. if it if it's not truthful to the overall story, you have to let it go. Yeah. Um, you have to to get to that spot where if this is not servicing the greater story, then it 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 it, ha- it can't be in there because then it, it's not being truthful, you know. And then, like you said, your audience is gonna sit there and like, I don't I don't believe that that does that doesn't <laughs> that doesn't feel right, you know. Because because ironically too, we also the, we don't give audiences enough credit. The, the audiences. We have, I think this was also too fascinating why, why we gravitate towards stories because we almost have the built-in mechanism where we, everyone is a great storyteller in their own right. We know when a story is BS and when a story is being truthful or when we'll buy into it. Um, and I think all of us have, we may not, not everybody might be able to articulate why they didn't like it or why it didn't work or what some of the faults were in it. They might not be able to critique it that way, but they can tell, like you said, when they're being fooled, when they're being betrayed, when something else just smells fishy. Long shot Hail Mary theory on that. Like if we're going back and we're looking at the origins of story around a campfire and oral tradition, if it's to teach a lesson, like if it were a story to teach a lesson or if we're like, you know, uh, passing on knowledge, like we are built to recognize the bullshit. Mm-hmm. Like I, I feel like it, it, it could go as far back as that. Like if you're trying to tell me that, uh, 
the monster is going to come out of the water and eat me. Like, I I'm, no, I, I don't buy that. I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing here on why we have these built-in mechanisms to rebel against a story or like something that doesn't hold water. That's interesting. That's a good point. Yeah. Or like the earth, the earth is not flat. The earth is not flat. <laughs> Why some of us still think, yeah, I don't know. That sounds, that sounds uh, suspect to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love things that sound suspect. I think, uh, you know, later on, I'd, I'd love to pick your brain about speaking of story and, and, and betraying and things like that and killing babies. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Joss Whedon, famous baby killer, uh, JK, famous baby killer, and then you know people having a tendency to go back and, and muck with their creations, yeah. like uh, like Lucas, uh, you know, which lots of respect for George Lucas, but like, why do you continue to go back and, and toy with stuff? Or JK, like, do you think comic for another cast, I guess, but do you think like you know authors should go back and and retrofit their work to fit new things and like she's constantly like just tweeting out some random shit like, oh, by the way, this wizards crapped in their road just made it disappear. Like, what are you you're completely devaluing your previous yeah. work? I think uh, also too, like, I think there's a little bit of of that control aspect of the ego sure. where we, you know, you think about, well, if I knew this or I had this at this time, especially with the filmmakers, I can understand like the technology Sure, if I have the ability to make the shark look just a little bit better. Yeah, I could go back and just make it really, really nice. But <laughs> you, what's interesting is that those movies still penetrated the zeitgeist. Yeah, you know, if you they really think about it, those movies worked. Like we were talking about at the very beginning, time and place. It it resonated with with the majority of people at the right time at the right space. And it really doesn't need to be muck with because it already did its job at that moment. And I feel that going back and fiddling with it is a little bit of the control aspect of the ego saying, well, I can make it better, you know, yeah. or I didn't like this because, you know, yeah, I was 20 years younger and I was thinking a lot differently and I had a different perspective, but now I could really, I could really make this same. Um, but it, it kind of had its moment when it needed to have its moment and going back and retooling it really doesn't add anything more than what it already accomplished. I feel like that kind of brings us full circle to what you said earlier on the, the first part, when we were talking about discovering authors, when you were meant to discover them and kind of finding things as yeah. you need to find them, like even as a, as a person who's creating like, and you talked about um, just needing to start getting stuff down. Like you can analyze and you can think about it and you can, rough around with it but at a certain point you just got to do yeah and start putting that at like start creating it because you're not going to be able to go back and fix it if you've never put it down in the first place yeah and you know, honestly it's not the creator's job to interpret after it's down uh -huh. you know it's kind of like almost the story you allow the story to go into the cosmos and then the cosmos just kind of integrates it into whichever way it wants to or needs to, you know, yeah. it, you are kind of, you've done your job. The, there was a, a wonderful um, quote that I, I came across and I keep referencing it or going back to it where uh, Martha Graham, she said, the, it is not your business to determine how good it is or how good it is, nor how valuable, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours clearly and directly to keep the channel open. That's all you're doing. You're just allowing it to flow through you. And then however it gets constructed or critiqued, that's that's not in your hands. That's You really have, don't need to do anything. I don't think that yeah. they, I, that's really awesome, man. Like that is a beautiful sentiment and something that I think anyone out there struggling to create or wanting to create should keep in mind. Like that, yeah. it's really something that reminds me a lot of uh, one of my favorite songwriters is Tori Amos mm. and about creating, you know, they're like, like you said, children, if we don't kill babies, not really, but, you know, creating her children, the, the muse speaks to her and yes. she, 
she, she lets the muse speak through her and these creations happen and then she sets them free out into the world and after they're out in the world they're no longer hers they yeah. are they have kind of sprung their own wings or got their own legs and they they go out and they do what the muse intended them to do and they will be interpreted how they're going to be interpreted yeah and, but you're never going to meet the muse unless you are there to meet the muse so if you're yeah. not putting those words on the page or doing whatever it is that you're doing to create the muse isn't going to show up and you're not going to have that ability to just allow your interpretation to flow through them and then out into the world um but yeah, yeah you're right it's just like you've got no control and that's that's also too what's great if you if you are able to perceive it from that perspective then it becomes like whatever critiques good or bad it doesn't fucking matter no it just rolls off because that's not that's not the point it's not your job anymore exactly so it really shouldn't it really shouldn't get you so high up with the with the praise and it really shouldn't get you all down with the criticism because yeah. it, it really either one is just okay that's how they're interpreting so that's 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 cool i i did my job i got it down yeah and i'm happy i'm happy yeah. that i got it down <laughs> i'm with you sir i'm with you so yeah i mean that's that's kind of just what i want to do with the show is i want to provide um almost it's it's a combination of an online diary you know like i'm going through my own process and trying to figure out things also but also maybe you know share some of the things that i've learned um and then try to share some of the content you know that comes out of out of out of it and then see if you know see just see a birth birth into the world i can't wait i for one am really excited man and i i know it's asking uh, a lot but you know i i'm got these little hopes that we might get little glimpses into the actual works i know you got to keep them close to the vest for your you know, because it's a commodity. It's you know, let's be honest. At a certain point, like you don't want anyone to steal your shit. But um, yeah, I would love to. Just the process alone is going to be worth the window into someone like yourself who's creating and letting the muse speak through you. Thanks, man. And also too, like yeah, I'm just just everybody else just trying to figure out the answers as well. So it's like it's going to be a cool. Oh, yeah. It'll be a cool way for me to kind of as well keep me on course keep me um uh just just keeping me on my toes making sure I'm, I'm being accountable and uh yeah well you gave out some hard numbers there on like number of pages and stuff so we'll all be checking in on you uh, yeah sure. <laughs> make sure that's going up <laughs> yeah make sure that it's going up the numbers keep going up or if they go back that they go back up you know two steps forward one step back exactly and the good thing is well one of the tricks that i have been trying to do is um uh the goal is I cannot buy myself or I cannot get a PlayStation 5 until I finish this spec script. Oh, so you we're getting close. <laughs> so I'm going to have to start build, you know, burning some midnight oil a few of these weeks coming up. And uh, otherwise, Anthony is totally not getting, <laughs> it's not getting no Christmas present this year. <laughs> Oh, well, good luck. Uh, and I'm glad that you have like, a, you got to treat yourself. You got to have a goal, got to have a reward system, I think. Yeah. And good luck with that, man. I appreciate it. Well, thanks again, man, for joining me. And I uh, appreciate this, this uh, platform. I uh, appreciate all the work and effort that you're putting into this thing. And uh, yeah, I hope this Ruminations radio network takes off and, you know, we, uh, we blow up. <laughs> can't wait to see what you've got man and like i said I, I respect your output so here's to that all right thanks a lot brother and uh I look forward to chatting again you've been listening to ruminations on tony's tall tales brought to you by the ruminations radio network if you like this cast or want to find some other great topics join me Hoptimus host of the Retro Futurist Culture podcast for great discussions on all things retro future. Check it out and all the other podcasts at ruminationsradionetwork.com.